Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of LawPod. My name is Dr. Nora Burns, and I'm an academic in the law school at Queen's University, Belfast. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Francis Fitzgerald, member of the European Parliament for Dublin. Francis sits with a group of the European People's Party, Christian Democrats in the Parliament, and is vice chair of that group. She has served as an MEP since 2019 and previously served as Tónaiste, or Deputy Prime Minister of the Government of Ireland, and has also held a number of ministerial portfolios. Francis, delighted to speak with you today and to talk about your work in the European Parliament and also your lifelong work on the issue of gender equality. Thank you very much, Francis, for being with us. We might start off today with a bit of a background uh, on your own career, what you studied and your career before you entered politics. Good afternoon, Nora. Delighted to be joining you. And basically what I did was I went to school in Dublin. My father was in the army, moved to Dublin when I was about 13, did my second level education with the Dominican nuns in Black Rock County, Dublin. Then I went to UCD, did a degree in social science and I did a master's. I had moved to live in London with my husband. I did my master's in social administration and social work in the London School of Economics, which I loved and practiced as a social worker for about 20 years. I was always interested in feminism and equality and reading the books of the time on feminism. And when I had my first son, I became very interested in women's voices and maternity care, still an issue today. I came back to Ireland and I got involved with an organization called the Women's Political Association, mostly because they ran these amazing seminars that about a thousand women went to in Dublin, became chair of that. Had a lot of American politicians over, European politicians, Petra Kelly, the original green activists from Germany, lots of really interesting, uh, primarily women. And then I got involved as a rep for them on the National Women's Council, lobbied the government on lots of different issues, everything from women in sport, women's health, women in the law, the whole range that an active body like the National Women's Council work on. I got the second commission on women established in Ireland, which then became a Bible from 1992 onwards for all the different arenas that needed action on equality. And then eventually I was doing lots of television and radio and everything. And I got approached by various political parties and I ran for Fidi Gale. And I've had a 30 year political career full of highs, full of lows. That's politics, Nora. Thanks, Francis. That's brilliant. And you kind of mentioned a little bit there about your work with the National Women's Council. And before you entered the Dáil, you chaired the Council for the Status of Women, and that was from 1988 to 92. How did you find chairing that group? And I suppose the work you were doing then on gender equality in Ireland in the late 1980s, it would have been quite challenging. Well, it was very exciting. I was a voluntary chair for those four years. We, as I say, lobbied every government department, women in agriculture, women in social welfare, women in law. We did everything. And I had a great group of women around me when I became chair. There was a lot of women who'd been active for 10 or maybe some of them 15 years before that. And and so we were a very committed group and we really enjoyed the work we did. And there was a good staff team as well. We got equality proofing, I think, around the first conference on equality proofing in Ireland. Probably the first conference on women and smoking, women's health issues. We took up a lot of the issues of the time. And we also worked on LG. DBQI plus issues then, marginalized women, migrant women. Then, of course, the X case came and we were active on that and various other referendums. We were all the time calling out for action, action, action. And most of it now is in place. 30 years later, we ran the first conference on women and decision making in Ireland. I remember Morgan and Quinn was the minister at the time. But this has become commonplace now to talk about having a critical mass of women. We had a lot of work to do because the numbers were so low. Even when I was Minister for Justice, I set up some monitoring of the figures at government level. It took 30 years to get them to 30 and 40%. It's a long journey. It's a long time to wait. And if we were to get full equality across the European Union, it's probably going to take at least another 60 or 80 years. So we have to accelerate it. But we have a lot of other issues to deal with as well. We have gender plus, we have neurodivergence, as I mentioned already, LGBTQI plus, you've raised ethnic issues and, and generational issues. So I think like it's gender plus now. You never leave gender behind, you keep working on it, but there are all these other areas as well now that we have to really work on. And Francis, what advice would you give to uh, a a younger female maybe who's thinking about stepping into politics or advocacy work or activist work or 
uh, on the broad area of, say, gender equality, what advice would you give looking back? I think it's in women's own interest. If you're interested in a more equal society, by all means, get involved. And there are human rights issues as well right across the world. So it's great to see younger women studying these topics. And we have so many new courses now and so many courses on law, for example, are creating greater awareness of all of this. If you decide to go down the legal route, that is so important. And it's so important to have great lawyers, great judges. These are the bulwarks against authoritarianism. That brings us nicely on to, to my next question. When you were Minister for Children and Youth Affairs, you put forward the, the referendum on children's rights in 2012, and that led to uh, a significant change in the constitution. Could you tell us a little bit about that piece of work and the challenges you faced? I think the, verse, uh, the person who has probably best summed up some of those changes in an academic work is Geoffrey Shannon where he writes in his classic textbook about the changes that has actually meant in the law. And basically that was about saying that children's rights should be in the constitution, that the voice of the child was important. This is a critical principle. The best interests of the child uh, were important and had to be taken into account. And also the children in a long-term foster could be adopted, given the best interests of the child principle applying. So it impacted on all of those areas. The main argument we came up against was that somehow you were infringing the rights of the family if you gave rights to the child instead of strengthening the family. So referendums are always tricky in Ireland, as we've seen recently. And that was a low turnout, but it was passed. And then there was a legal challenge for some literature we'd produced. And that took a few years to sort out, which was a very anxiety provoking time, to say the least. And I was delighted when that then was passed. So, I mean, I think a lot of law has followed from it. And uh, so uh, from a principal point of view, it was great that the Irish constitution was able to be inclusive of children. Also during his time uh, as Minister for Justice and Equality, you brought in the Children First legislation. And that was a key piece of legislation as well on raising awareness of, say, child abuse and neglect. And would you think your previous work as a social worker would have helped to inform your thinking about the need for that legislation? I mean, there's no doubt as a young woman, I didn't realize it at the time, but I did love my social science. I did love the sociology of education, the sociology of health. I loved understanding social problems and then dealing with them directly as a social worker. And it's extraordinary how all of those building blocks came together when I was Minister for Children. I worked for 20 years in the UK, as I said, and I worked in inner city Dublin and in Ballymun. And I worked with children and families in a specialist agency. So all of that was incredibly helpful because social work and politics, you're reacting to the public, you're networking, you're influencing. And they, they're kind of similar in some ways, you know, probably some politicians have thought I'm too much of a social worker and some social workers have thought I'm too much of a politician. <laughs> but I thought the combination was uh, very good. You kind of touched on it a little bit there as well. And you've talked in the past as well about how you see that the state should take a more proactive role around childcare and paternity leave and parental leave. We now have a provision for paternity leave. Do you see that there's more work left to be done? And what would you see that piece of work being? There's a huge piece of work to be done in all our countries. We speak about Ireland, but everywhere, UK, across Europe, on understanding the impact of care on women's lives and really appreciating it at a societal level. So I was instrumental in getting the first care strategy at a European level from Ursula von der Leyen there two years ago. And that's really important because that lays out what we can do at European level in relation to care. And it's primarily understanding the dimensions of care. It's about those who do the care and those who are cared for, what the challenges will be up ahead and the impact on women's lives. We saw this during COVID in particular, huge impact on women's lives. Now, women will want to have children, will want to look after them themselves will want to care for parents. It's not to do away with the family role, but it's to support and help. And if as a society we want women to continue having children, we're going to have to make the conditions better because guess what? What's happening is where the conditions aren't good enough, people stop having children. And you see that around the world. We have to make it feasible for families to combine work and family life by our state policies. We have to appreciate the impact of care on women's careers. And we have to take steps to support women and, and men, of course, 
in those situations. The fertility question comes up, you know, if we're, people are going to go ahead and have children at a time when they still have fertility before 35, approximately, then you're going to have to make young women and young men's careers, you're going to have to make it feasible for them to continue their careers if they have children. So there's very big issues there for companies, for governments, for society to really look at seriously because uh, people are worried about demography now. Kind of leading a little bit on from that as well as taking that leadership position. In 2016, you were appointed to the role of Thonishtel, the second highest political office in government. How did you find that role? And I suppose as well, the, the stepping up into that significant leadership position and also then from a perspective as a woman leader, how did you find it? I must say I found it extremely interesting and worthwhile. It was slightly different than at the moment because I was tarnished uh, with two Fine Gael T-shirts. So I was very much helping them. You have less opportunity in some ways to develop the role in its own right. So if you're a tarnished from another political party, you're forging a separate identity. You're out there all the time protecting your own political party. I was very much working behind the scenes with the two T-shirt that I worked with. And you were just smoothing the way on pieces of legislation, linking with other ministers, backbenchers, all of that. But it, it was a great honour, very significant role. And I was very honoured. I was the first Fine Gael woman to be in that role, which was a very significant appointment of me by and trust in me by Enda Kenny, which I really appreciated at the time and a reappointment then by Leo. And it, it kind of signaled as well to women in politics and women outside politics as well, you know, that a, a woman could be a Thonishta or a Taoiseach and the, the significance of that role in Irish society. Well, and there's been four women being Taoiseach, only four since the foundation of the state. And I was the first Fianna Gael. You had a Fianna Fáil, you had Mary Harney and you had Labour. Interestingly, one from each of those political party. So it's a unique honour and certainly we want to see more uh, and more women in, in that position. Moving a little bit now to your career in Brussels, can I ask what made you want to run in the 2019 European Parliament election? I guess to summarise it, they, the opposition decided for purely party political reasons to put a vote of no confidence in me in the doll. It looked like it could be an election. And rather than have an election, I decided to resign. And that was obviously a very low point in the Charlton Tribunal then. So I like the rule of law so much came out and showed very clearly there was no substance whatsoever to the charges that were made. Quite the opposite. I'd always worked to support whistleblowers. So I won't rehash that. It's well documented in Charlton. It came up and it was suggested to me. And then I began to consider it. And I thought, well, I've always been a big fan of your, why not? And a lot of former prime ministers and ministers and people who've held political office go on to Europe. We don't always, from Ireland, send people who've been ministers, and very rarely, actually. We've had one or two have gone on to be commissioner, obviously. I had always been a believer in it. I always loved Dublin. I had represented two different constituencies. And so it was such an honour to go forward, to be nominated by the party. The party were very supportively over Adcor at the time, and they kind of felt they owed me a little bit, I think, after what had happened. <laughs> And I got elected. I got a great response. So I've had five wonderful years and I've decided I had the last meeting this week in Strasbourg, just came back recently and I really enjoy the work, would encourage. I'm the biggest fan of your, I really am. I, I think it's a great, the whole, the three institutions, the council, the commission, the parliament, the parliament's a great place to work. 39% of women there, critical mass of women makes a difference. Very sophisticated political engagement, looking for consensus all the time, trying to build a consensus across the parliament first, and then with the council and the trilogue and the commission when you're in negotiations. Francis, many people who are listening to this conversation, they may have never been to the parliament. Could you tell us a little bit about what does a week in the life of an MEP actually look like? From an Irish perspective, it tends to look like this. I tend to go out on a Monday to Brussels and I stay until Thursday evening. I come home and work Fridays and weekends in Ireland and do that for every week for three weeks. And then on the fourth week, I go to Strasbourg, fly to Frankfurt, get a car down to the parliament in Strasbourg and meet there from Monday to Thursday as well. Very intensive engagements in meetings while you're there, primarily committee work. I work on the Econ Committee and on the Women's Rights Committee. I'm also on the Development Committee as a substitute. I do some work on EU-USA relationships and some other interest groups. 
It helps. It's very interesting. You can host seminars for interest groups. You meet a lot of people. You can host visitors to the European Parliament in Brussels or in Strasbourg. You spend a lot of time working with your group. I mean, the EPP, as you said, the European People's Party. You spend a lot of time figuring out our position on the topic before the parliament. I was also on the presidency of that, so that was kind of the executive. So you'd be planning Europe-wide on the work program of the EPP and primarily our responses in parliament. So it's, it's multi-layered. You have in your group, in your political party, you have the executive, then you have the heads of all the 27 delegations, and then you have all the members from the different member states. So we all meet several times a week as a big group and in different formations. So that takes quite a bit of time. And then you're going into the parliament to speak and to vote. It's very complex. But the best way to get a grasp of it is for people to come over to the parliament. And any MEP will support a group of people coming over and it's very good value. And they do a kind of a two or a three day introduction to the parliament. And it's, you know, people should come to Brussels and Strasbourg and see how it works. There's nothing like that. And it's, they're beautiful places like the Strasbourg Parliament's very beautiful, lovely building, nice place to work. And the Brussels a bit more kind of bureaucratic looking, but equally incredible amount of work going on there all the time. So, and then you're representing your country's position on different topics too, like in the Econ Committee. A challenge that has been levelled, or a criticism I should say, is that the EU lacks a connection to what happens in domestic countries. So how do you engage with your constituents in the Dublin constituency on those issues that are before you at the EU level? Well, we need more communication with our media. That's not our fault. There isn't space in the media for a lot of the routine work we do. When there's a crisis like Brexit or the nature restoration law, you get a lot of coverage and you get coverage of individual votes, but the day-to-day work doesn't get covered up. But 70% of our legislation plus comes from Europe. So it's really important to know what's happening. The way you engage actually is like, for example, I do a lot of work in schools, meeting primary schools, second level schools, and they're all doing the flags, the green flag, the environmental flag and so on. And that's really good. The European Parliament does a lot here. I do meetings in the European Parliament office in Dublin. I do a lot of seminars, online seminars on different topics like rare diseases. Obviously, I do work on gender equality. You bring the groups over to Brussels, you meet. I do a lot of meetings here in Dublin when I'm here on a Friday with people who effectively are watching the legislation in Brussels and want to change it. As part of your work, you were elected as the EPP's coordinator in the Women's Rights and Gender Equality, the FEM Committee. And recently as well, you were the lead on the drafting of the EU Directive on Violence Against Women. Do you think the EU is doing enough on gender equality issues? I do, actually. This has been an incredibly positive period, probably the best ever in a mandate in a parliamentary session. So this is partly down to Ursula von der Leyen and a gender balanced commission for the first time ever, equal numbers of women and men commissioners. We had a very successful period and not in any way complacent. There's a lot of work to do, but the EU has done an awful lot in the last five years. So we've had pay transparency directive. That will really make a difference, force companies to show what women and men are being paid. That will deal with the pension pay gap and the pay gap over time. We've had the Women on Boards Directive, critical mass of women on on state boards, publicly funded boards. We have the equality bodies legislation. We've had the victims legislation. We've had trafficking. We've had the ratification of the Istanbul Convention by Europe, which waited 10 years. Now we just had by directive has just been voted overwhelmingly through first EU directive ever on violence against women. And that's just been agreed. So it's been very positive, not to be complacent, not to say there isn't more to do. For law students listening in, I'm sure there would be a curiosity about how legislation is drafted in the parliament. Could you give us a little insight into that procedure or that process? Well, first, let me say to the law uh, students who are listening, what you're doing is so important because, I mean, law just matters so much. We see the rule of law under threat in some countries. We see a move towards authoritarianism. We see democracy under threat. Having brilliant lawyers, having brilliant solicitors, barristers, judges, it's a fantastic bulwark for democracy and we need to really, and I really do value it so much. I think I mentioned that already. The way a legislation is drafted, obviously we get a proposal from the commission, commission initiates, they do a lot of work. So we get lots and lots of potential legislation. 
We then start the work. A rapporteur is appointed. So I was the rapporteur. I'm the director from Violence Against Women, along with associates, colleague from Sweden. You have the rapporteur. The rapporteur then meets all of those who are appointed from the different political groups. You have meetings with them to try and hammer out a common position. Hopefully you get to that point. You go for a vote in the committee, the relevant committee, and then you go for a vote in the parliament. And then you vote to go into trilogues with the commission and the council. And then you begin negotiating all over again to get the three aligned. And that's the process. Usually takes about between 13 months and two years. One of the things, I suppose, when I'm teaching EU law that we talk about a lot with the students is the different institutions and the balancing of power between those different institutions. Do you feel that there is an adequate balance between the institutions at the moment or is there a need for some of the power to be redistributed between the institution? No, it's hard to know how you would redistribute it. But at the end of the day, the prime ministers, they almost have a a defining look over the legislation. We've had an experience recently, a bit unusual, of them watering down something that's been agreed in a trilogue. That's unusual. But that is happening. So you have to keep an eye on that. And sometimes if you need a qualified majority, you just can't get it for certain things. And that comes from a decision of those big member states, particularly France and Germany, if you want a qualified majority. The council really, I mean, prime ministers, and I guess they are elected democratically at the end of the day. The parliament is elected democratically. The commission is a sort of standalone body. It's pretty good, I'd say, Nora. You probably have a better idea of areas where it needs tweaking almost. It's subtle enough, but it's a dance between the three of them. And I mean, generally speaking, if you get a good trilogue agreement, it tends to be okay by the perm reps and then by the, the ministers. But sometimes it isn't. So then the real power comes into play of the council of ministers. I'm speaking with you today from Belfast and we are post-Brexit. In your view, do you see the relationship now between the UK and the EU and the institutions in Brussels being in a more positive space? Ever so slightly. I wouldn't exaggerate it for a moment. I think Brexit has been an absolute wrench. I think it's been really damaging in terms of relationships. I think it's gone a bit more neutral in the last year, probably thanks to Richie Sunak and some of the moves he's made. But I wouldn't hold my breath. I think it's going to take time. That's not what I like to see, but I think it's going to be very slow, Nora, from what I can see. I I think that particularly on both sides, there's a lot of repair needed in the relationship. And there's the politics of the UK as well. Doesn't seem to allow for any fast engagement or re-engagement with Brexit. Another thing that's on the agenda at the moment being discussed in Ireland is the Directive on Adequate Minimum Wages and discussions about the implementation of the Directive. Do you, in general, feel that there is good implementation of directives in Ireland? It varies a little bit. It's not as good as it should be. I think our mechanisms to monitor aren't strong enough and they're not fast enough. And I I think we have set up a committee recently to look at the future implementation, and that's a good step. But I think we haven't got fast enough mechanisms to uh, to, um, bring directives into law. I think there's work to be done. No, it was seen as very far away. I think with the war in Ukraine and Palestine, Israel and COVID and the the whole unrest in agriculture, I think the EU is seeming to be closer and more relevant, actually, and of course with Brexit. So I think we need more transparency in the implementation. Sometimes it's kind of left to departments and ministers. It doesn't feature hugely. You do an annual report to cabinet or every three month report or whatever. But I don't think it's real enough in the life of the parliament. It's probably a little bit tedious for people, you know, I think there is scope for it in a good parliamentary democracy to make sure they're implemented properly and speedily. I'd say speed is the issue. Just this week, you shared an image of yourself and also with your wonderful team that supports you um, in Brussels um, when you were leaving the European Parliament building for the last time. Um, As you mentioned earlier, you won't be running in this summer's election. What would you see as the key issues for the new parliament when it sits after the election? Well, you know, they're very serious. And I have had a great team working with me. You don't do it on your own, obviously. But basically, this is a terribly serious time. This is a time of enormous change. Tess talks about it as a time of a pre-war in Europe or a war economy. There's some truth to that, obviously, with what's happening in Ukraine and in Israel and Palestine. It's really serious. 
So we're moving into a period where peace has to be on the agenda, where complete ceasefire has to be on the agenda in both places. It's a very serious time from a budgetary point of view as well, because of the impact of the war on budgets. It's a very serious time in, in, in science of implementing the Green Deal and trying to make it easier for the ordinary citizen, because, of course, the thinking is right behind it, but it's not always easy to implement. And the same with business, implementing all of the legislation that's been passed, business is finding it overwhelming. So there's quite a big agenda there and a very big agenda out there. Would you have concerns in the election about a political shift in terms of how people will vote in this election? Well, I think the public have to think very carefully about who they want to send to Europe. What voice do they want for Ireland in, in Europe? Do you want a voice that's more, that will safeguard the Irish economy, that would encourage foreign direct investment, that will be reasonable in its approach and supportive of business, uh, who is going to get more coverage on Russian and Chinese television than they do on European television? But you've got to think these things through very, very carefully. Do you want people who express a more centrist view, who know that these are issues. These are the issues of our time, crime in our streets, dealing with the migration crisis. So I do think the indications are that you will have more right-wing extremists in the parliament, and it remains to be seen how that will impact the overall governance of the parliament. And I think we'll have to see, can, can the centre hold? Really, the old story, can the centre hold? And can democracy hold? So you need very, you need serious politicians going to Europe who are aware of the authoritarian threat. It's also time to support innovation in Europe, keep innovation in Europe, support business. And we really have to look at how we can keep, that's going to be a big task next time. How does the geopolitics of Europe have, have to force more in, innovation to stay in Europe? So how do we do that? Kind of following on from that, what do you see as Ireland's role within the EU currently? Ireland is well regarded. Um, I think our role is a little bit of what I've, I've outlined to you. I mean, we tend to reflect those values. We're strong diplomatically. We aren't as strong as the Germans or the French numerically. We have an important role as a smaller member state with other member states who are smaller as well. With the Baltics, Luxembourg, Holland, we tend to have a lot in common with the smaller countries. And everybody has a voice in Europe. That's a great thing. You may not have equal numbers, but you have equal representation in the Commission. But we need to make sure we send people to the admin side of the European uh, institutions as well. We did have more people at a senior level than we have at present. So that's something to watch. I have to encourage our lawyers and young people to work in the European institutions, to do internships, to get a flavor for it, because that's how you learn to like something if you get to know it a little bit better as a student. You mentioned earlier your own role with the National Women's Council and also you've talked as well about the impact your experience of working in various communities has had on your kind of legislative work. I suppose at the moment there's a climate where people are talking about the role of civil society organisations and NGOs. What would be your own reflections? You reflected a little bit there on the role of democracy, but on the role, say, of civil society and, and the NGO sector. Well, I think it's huge. And I think that we have to do, the political system has always to build bridges with the NGO sector and the other way around as well. I often quote this idea that when you're outside politics, you think all of the power is in the elected politicians. And, and then when you're inside this elected politician, you can sometimes think the NGOs are driving everything. You know, the truth is society is made up of elected politicians and civic society and NGOs and, and, and many different groups. And it's about all of them working effectively. Now, politics can lead and is very important leadership role. The NGOs tend to have the finger on the pulse. Now, so do politicians. But there can be different perspectives on issues and there can be a lot of specialism in NGOs, whether you're working with different ethnic issues or racial issues or any of the other areas, disability. And after a pearl, you don't listen to the NGOs, in my view. Now, by the way, there's very different attitudes in Europe. I have experienced politicians who are completely anti-NGO in Europe and feel that they have far too much power and want to limit it all the time and see them as all being on the left and that they don't, don't reflect the whole of society. So I think NGOs are actually in Europe under a little bit of attack. You've recently been named the eighth most influential MEP in the parliament. You were also recently a joint winner of the European Values Champion of the Mandate. 
at the Parliament Magazine's annual MEP Awards. What do you see as European values today? And how do you feel about how important you have been and how did you achieve that impact? I'm very honoured to receive those awards. I think because I was vice president of the EPP, that's one of the reasons that I've seen as being influential in that group. I probably am more to the centre and even slightly to the left compared to many in that group. So I'm probably seen as having influenced that group in certain directions, certainly in relation to gender equality. So I think that's been a great opportunity for me. I've really enjoyed it and I've got a very good response in the EPP. Not all the time, but most of the time. And I, I think the values question is really important. I think I'd say to any lawyer, I'd say to any young person, be absolutely clear. Sometimes with politicians, you don't quite know what their values are. I, I, I think you have to know why you're in the business. And, and everyone has slightly different motivations. So I think the values of the EU, you've got to really align with those. The rule of law, the respect for press freedom, the values of minding the individual, treating people with dignity. These are all the fundamental values that, you know, of the EU. And they're really important. And look, none of us live up to them all the time. But I think we have to try and live by those. And obviously, if they align with your own values, so much the better. And, and you should, in my case, they do. But the more I've learned about politics, the more I understand that the job is to influence. You're influencing your own party. You're influencing public opinion. You're bringing that lens to, to issues. So I think that's kind of, I've learned more about that because I've been in it a long time now. And I don't think I hesitate to use my influence now compared to in the earlier years when I was quite shy in politics and still learning an awful lot, really. So I've been able to build up the experiences I've had and that's helped me. I'm not afraid of leading. I'm not afraid of influencing. I think I'd use that to the full in Europe, probably almost more than ever, which was a great opportunity and a privilege to have it. But I wouldn't over-exaggerate. You get some awards, you don't get others. <laughs> it's quite varied. <laughs> Can I ask, what was the highlight of your domestic career in Irish politics? And then secondly, what was the highlight of your career in Brussels, in the Parliament? I think the highlight is being made a minister in any career. If you reach that point, that was certainly a, a complete highlight. And then the work I was privileged to do in each of those ministries. And obviously there are certain high, uh, high points around referendums and so on. But really the privilege of being in that position, tough and all as it can be at times. When I look back on it now, it's kind of almost hard to believe you did it. But that's definitely sort of from a political point of view, if you're in that position, you are able to influence and take leadership and hopefully do things for the betterment of society, genuinely for individuals. So that's definitely, I would say, the, the high point. But I always remember the first time I was elected and I thought, I just don't believe this because it happened very quickly way back in 1992. And I remember walking into the doll and saying, God, am I in here? I, if I hadn't planned to be a politician, I kind of grew out of the work I was doing and the activism I was involved in. So that was great. And I, I'd say in Europe, it's been very satisfying work, actually. Getting the directive through, that moment when the directive came through, because you just never quite know until the last minute with votes in the European Parliament. Getting the trilogue agreement originally, th those moments are very precious, really. And the friendships to the European Parliament across culture are really, they're just a marvellous experience. So I would say to any younger person, do consider working in Brussels, do consider working in one of the institutions. Because it's a very unique uh, experience and you can bring it back to Ireland or to whatever country you're from. I suppose lastly then, you've indicated that you're not going to run in the next election. Do you have plans for the future? Are you going to stay involved in community work, political work, etc.? Yeah, I probably will. I'm not quite sure yet, Nora, to be honest. I will do some work on the issues I've always worked on. i would be working with Fiona Gale. I'm delighted Simon Harris is the new Taoiseach. I think he'll do a great job. It's a very short time frame between the next election, both local and European and national. But I'm excited at what he can do in Ireland and for Ireland and for citizens and for the party, obviously. But it is challenging. We do live in a time of enormous change. We live in a time of instant media. We live in a time where things are stereotyped very quickly. So there's plenty of work to do. You know, I don't have anything more specific in mind than being involved generally. And I'll, I'll see how I go and how I feel as the, over the next few months. I'll try and recover from all of the, uh, the work for a little while first. 
Thank you so much, Francis, for chatting with us today on LawPod. This has been a fantastic episode and I think will be really beneficial both to a general audience and also to my EU law students particularly who I'll be inviting to listen in. So finally, thank you so much and the very best of luck uh, for the future. Or thanks so much, Nora, for asking me. It's always a privilege to be asked your opinion and to be given so much time. Normally in the European Parliament, I get a minute. Uh, so thank you for all of that time and a pleasure. And I hope your students enjoy it and follow up their interest in European affairs. Thank you.